Hey guys, my name is Rhonda Slater. I am founder of Pierced by Love, which is a prophetic heart healing and Christian life coaching business, uh, also known as inner healing and deliverance in some circles. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the parable of the laborer of vineyards. Um, my book, my Bible calls it laborers in the vineyard. Um, most of you know it as the early workers, the late workers, and I'm going to read a little bit of it in just a moment, but I have my Bible here and I have my, uh, my journal here, and I'm just going to talk about some things that the Lord's been talking to me about lately. I think it's very important that we know truth because the Lord said that the truth will set us free. And so as we read Jesus's parables, we can get layers and layers of truth through them. And with every layer of truth that we receive, our hearts get freer and freer. So, so here we go. Let me read the laborers in the vineyard uh, parable. This is found in Matthew 20. And goes through uh, the first verse through uh, verse 16. So a little bit of a read here, but there, some of our viewers may not know this parable. So I want to be sure we're all on the same page. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went and going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. The same as the first workers, right? Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last workers only worked one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. There's a lot of uh, interpretation of this parable. A lot of it is people who are saved in the last days, get the same thing of people that are saved in earlier days. So somebody follows Jesus all their life. They get the same reward in heaven as someone who uh, received Jesus in their last breath. That's not wrong. That's not wrong. There are more interpretations though to it uh, that I believe. And so I think when we first read it, we, we do feel this little bit of unfairness because there have been some workers that have been working for a long time and they're not getting, um, a better wage than those that have only worked for a little bit. And so there's something, I think, even in our, especially in our American culture that has a culture of working hard to get what you receive. And that's not wrong. I'm not against that. Um, but what we're going to look at today is the heart posture, because what I believe in this parable, that it is not exposing necessarily the heart of the father in this. Yes, he is generous, but it's actually exposing the heart of the workers that were first called. So I'm going to read a little bit out of my journal because as the Lord spoke to me, I began to write it down. Um, God does not work on a striving system or a get what you earn system. The first hired workers had this mindset. Jesus paid for all and none of the merit is on our own. Paul had said that, um, that faith is a gift, right? Not by our works so that no man can boast. So faith is free. Salvation is a free gift. We can't earn it. 
in any way, shape or form. We could never pay what we needed to pay to pay for, for our own uh, sin, for our own bad choices, for the things that we've done wrong. We can never pay enough to get out from underneath the generational curse that has come from Adam. We can never pay for that. So Jesus paid that for us. So if you want to get what you earned, the Bible actually says that the wages or what we earned from sin is death. So if we want to have the mindset of getting what we earned, then what we actually earned is death. But that's not God's heart, right? It's not his heart to give us death. That's why he sent his son. If we have earning mindsets, we are back under the law and we are not under the grace that Jesus paid for us to freely have. Let's take a look at Isaiah 55 1. I'm going to flip there real quick. See if I can get there quickly. Isaiah 55 1 is a, a powerful um, demonstration of the heart of God towards his people. It says this Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So I believe this first called worker that was grumbling, that said that we have borne the burden of the day, that we have worked in the scorching heat. I don't believe that the master of the house actually ever required that of him. I think that that was in his own doing. That was in his own works, his own works, striving mindset that he went out and he, he labored in the hot sun and he didn't stop. He didn't barely take a, a drink of water. He worked hard all day. There's nothing wrong with a good work ethic that wants to uh, work well for, because Paul also says that, um, that we should work well for our masters, right? That, it, that, and then Jesus said that if they tell us to go, oh, what is it? Seven miles and go an extra mile, like carry the cloak an extra mile, right? There is a mindset, but we can't do that extra. We can't go that extra mile just on our own strength. We have to have that heart posture of love. It's supernatural, right? It's not in our own natural strength. Especially in American culture, we want what we've earned. We've talked about that a little bit. When we work, we want to be paid. And there are parables uh, are more looking at heart postures. So I just talked about that a little bit, not, not as much as natural outcomes, right? We spend our lives working for food, shelter, retirement savings, and none of these are bad, but they become idols when our focus is there, right? Jesus said, our, our eye is the lamp of the body and whatever we have our focus on, it's whatever you are, have your, your goals set on again, nothing wrong with paying the bills, nothing wrong with saving money, nothing wrong with this, these things, but if we're not careful, they can become idols in our heart and that can become our whole life goal. And we've totally missed the life that Jesus prophesied over us in the womb, that he desired for us to have the joy, the peace, the love to walk this life out with him. We miss our purpose and our calling in the Lord when we just focus on the things of the world. So we don't want to put a worldly mindset or a mindset of Babylon, right? The Bible talks about Babylon representing the world. We don't want to put the Babylon mindset mindset on the kingdom of God. We want to rest. And I guarantee you that you can do more work out of love and for the Lord and delighting in him than you can ever do in your own strength. The vineyard workers were focused on their wages. They were even focused on others' wages. So they not only had their eyes on what they got, but they had their eyes on what other people were getting too. So in case you don't know, comparison jealousy, those are demonic spirits. We don't want to partner with that. We want to look at what the Lord is giving us because he's good and he knows what we need. And sometimes he may give somebody else something different because it's what they need. And we can't perceive that from the world's eyes. We have to perceive that with spiritual eyes. Lord, why are you giving me this amount? What are you wanting me to do with it? What, what are you teaching me? How are you guiding me? He's a good shepherd, right? So keep this in mind too, that this master of the land here in this parable of the vineyard is the same master that is the father in the parable of the prodigal son, 
right? The heart that saw the son running down the road and loved him so much that he didn't, he didn't require him to do anything but come home and he threw a robe on him and he threw a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and he threw a big party, right? This is the same master that owns this vineyard. So he's putting the same heart forth upon those in his vineyard as he, as he is uh, in those stories as well. Keep in mind also Boaz, if you've read the book of Ruth. So Ruth was laboring in the field uh, for necessity, right? They needed food, her and her mother-in-law, they needed food, but for love, she came to uh, Israel with uh, Naomi out of love. She loved, she respected not only Naomi, but, but Naomi's God, Yahweh, right? So she followed her. She said, let your God be my God. I'll go where you go. So she finds herself in this field and she's just getting what she can to take home to eat. And Boaz, he he is um, an Israelite. He is generous and kind. Do you see how he treats his labor workers? Like they took meal breaks. They had water. They, they, they were provided for lavishly. And do you remember what he did for Ruth, who didn't even belong to the Israelites? She was a Moab, Moabitess. <sighs> she didn't belong to them. He was so gracious. He brought her in, made her one of his people, fed her at his table, let her drink water with his people. And he even told them to leave her sheaves of wheat behind to help with her labor. Oh, beloved, that is working in the kingdom, right? We're so full of joy and we're well taken care of. We're not looking what we don't have. We're looking what God is providing and we're gracious. We're grateful. And we just pick up these sheaves as we walk along hand in hand with the Lord of all Lords. In these last days, as younger generations surpass us, I'm talking to maybe some ministers out there. I'm talking to people that have been walking with the Lord for a long time, who's who have perhaps cultivated a lot of oil with the Lord. A lot of deep things have prayed for a long time for revival, have, have just walked a journey for even decades with the Lord. In these last days, as younger generations surpass us in signs, wonders, miracles, giftings, and other things of God, will we be bitter and grumble at God? Were we the first workers called to the vineyard? Will we be mad when we see the younger people raise up in amazing giftings and miracles that are flowing from their hands? Or we will we smile and revel in the wonder of his goodness and find gratefulness in our hearts for the years that we have partnered with him to cultivate the soil that these ones are growing up into? What does that remind you of to grumble? Probably the older brother in the prodigal son story, right? He had been there all along and he had grumbled when the father wanted to give that son a party and throw the robe upon his back. He wanted to grumble. It's not the heart, right heart posture, my friends. God is good and living in his house is a delight. The father told that older son that you've been here all along. You had access to the fatted calf. You had access to everything I own all along. Why was that not a joy for the older brother to be in the house? David said that he had one thing he desired. It was to live in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon his beauty. So how did the older brother miss it? How did he miss it? His eyes were focused on his works. His eyes were focused in the natural on what he received or didn't receive. His eyes weren't focused on the one who is love. His eyes weren't, re weren't focused on receiving value and enjoying life, delighting in the one who is delight, delighting in the one who is joy and peace and everything we need for life and godliness. Here's another really important point that I want to make, that if we were really to get down to it, 
Jesus is the only. I'm feeling the spirit in here. Jesus is the only early worker. He was God's son before the beginning of time. He was the one that was called first, and he's the one that bore the brunt of the work. He's the one that endured the scorching heat, my friends. He is the one that paid it all. He went before us, and truly all of us are just workers called late <laughs> into the vineyard, right? And Jesus did the brunt of the work for us. And so we honor him for that and we rejoice because we are also latecomers. Let us rejoice whether we are the first ones that have been walking with the Lord for decades or whether we are last or if we are the last that are called first, let us rejoice because we have a good father who's full of love and mercy and tenderness. He is not a task mask master, but a loving father. And once I rightly see my beautiful father, I have no trouble calling him master. I know that in my heart, if I have trouble calling father, God, master, there's something untrue. I'm believing about his nature and his goodness. When we work out of a heart posture of love and not duty, his work becomes joyful, becomes a partnership in which we find our life's purpose and our destiny. And it will be our joy to be last. Out of love, we release entitlement. That's not of the kingdom. We release jealousy. We release comparison. And we love to just revel in the beauty of living in the kingdom, even here on earth. So beloved, if you don't know Father God like that, if he doesn't really seem to be a good, generous father to you, take a moment just to ask him, Father, why do I not see you that way? What lies do I have in my heart about you? Sometimes it's fruitful to know how those lies came in. Is there a memory or what in my life, what in my childhood led me to believe that about you? And then say, Father, I hand that to you. It's not who you are. Tell me the truth about who you are. Well, beloved, thank you so much for listening today. I hope those truths set you free. Let go of all earning and striving in the kingdom and know that when you're freely loved by the Lord, you'll do more than you ever could have in your own strength. To connect with me, you can visit piercedbylove.com. And until next time, be blessed. <laughs>